congregation may be seated. Our presiding bishop, the Reverend Purity Malinga, our former presiding bishop, Reverend Zipo Zichle Siwa, our connectional lay president, Mr. James Nkosi, former presidents and presiding bishops, and general secretaries of the MCSA who are joining us virtually, members of the connectional executive, including bishops and lay leaders of the synods, the general treasurer, unit directors, wardens of the orders, and representatives of the organizations. Members of our ecumenical family who are joining us virtually, my mothers and fathers, my brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, grace and peace to you from God, our creator parent, Jesus Christ, our redeemer and liberator, and the Holy Spirit, our healer and transformer. I deem it a singular honor and privilege this evening to welcome you all both those who are physically present here at the Bedford View Methodist Church, as well as those who are on the various virtual platforms, including Zoom, where the members of the Connectional Executive are currently joining in the service, and of course, everyone who has joined us on our Facebook and YouTube platforms want to welcome you to this very special and significant service of worship to mark the beginning of our 2020 Connectional Executive Meetings. Madam Presiding Bishop, due to the global destructive pandemic of COVID-19 and its consequential various protocols and restrictions, a special Connectional Executive Meeting which was held virtually on the 23rd of May, resolved to, in addition of suspending the gathering of annual synods, to also suspend the holding of our annual conference, and in its stead, to convene a virtual sitting of the Connectional Executive, which would, in addition to transacting its normal business, also transact the essential business of conference. As part of the essential business of conference, we are to publicly receive the address of the president of the conference and presiding bishop of the Methodist Church of Southern Africa, as she would offer through that address spiritual leadership, missional direction, pastoral wisdom as the chief pastor and official head of the Methodist Church of Southern Africa. So this evening, brothers and sisters, we gather wherever we are, participants in an historical act of worship, to give thanks to God, to celebrate the bounties of God's grace, and to offer ourselves anew to God's service and in fulfilling God's mission. Unprecedented, Madam Presiding Bishop, is a word that has become a part of our language, not only in the events surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic, but also for the people called Methodist, in that in its over two century old history in Southern Africa, this evening will be the first address by a presiding bishop who is a woman significantly bringing to culmination and connecting us to that breathtaking, spirit-led decision of the 1976 conference to allow the candidature of women as ministers in the Methodist Church of Southern Africa. This service this evening is a special one on many, many levels. So we welcome you warmly to join us as we unite our hearts, our souls, 
minds and bodies through the airways and networks across the valleys, mountains and oceans ready to celebrate God's goodness in the past, to praise God in the now, and to look forward to God's leading in the future. Welcome to all of you as we join in this act of worship. We invite the presiding bishop now to light the conference and connectional executive candle. The true spirit that shines on all people has come into the world. We light this candle to remember that Christ is the light of the world and that in Christ we too are called light of the world. Let us pray. In this connectional executive by your spirit, Lord, with true courage, Lord, courage, with love for you and yours, Lord, in eternal hope, Lord, keep us. Amen. I invite us now to join our hearts and our souls as we pray together, which will be followed by the Lord's Prayer, which will be sung in English at the end. Come, let us pray. Holy God, to you alone belong glory, honor, and praise. We join right now across the networks and in the various places where we are with the hosts of heaven as we worship. For you alone, O oh God, are worthy of our adoration from every mouth and every tongue, we shall sing your praise. You created the earth by your power. And you continue to save the human race in your mercy. You continue to renew it through your grace. And so to you, loving God... Parent, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor, glory, and praise. We give you thanks, O God, that you have brought us together in this time and in the various places where we are in a united act of worship of praise and of thanksgiving for your manifold blessings that you have bestowed upon us as individuals and especially this evening upon us as a family in you called Methodist. We give you thanks, O God, for your faithfulness that has led us as the nations of the world and as your people through the pandemic that has been so destructive and that has changed even the cause of our history. We gather tonight in recognition that it has been your grace, your mercy and your faithfulness 
that has allowed us as a Methodist people this evening again to behold your grace and your face and to be able to see each other's face. We gather to offer you all our thanks, all our praise, and all our honor. And yet, O oh God, as we gaze upon your goodness and the lovingness of your face and experience in you your grace, we recognize that we have sinned against you. And so we come this evening and we want to confess to you our foolishness and our thoughtless use of the gifts of your creation. We want to confess our neglect of you and our failure to care for others. We want to confess our selfishness in prayer and our carelessness in worship. And so we come, O oh God, and pray that you would be merciful to us as we claim your promised forgiveness through him who is our Lord and our Savior. And so in this moment of silence, I invite each of us now to examine our own consciences and to share those things which most trouble us at this moment with God as we confess. And so here is the good news for all of us who put their trust in Christ. Jesus says to us, your sins are forgiven. Therefore, we give thanks to you, O God. And so, through the thankfulness of our hearts, we offer to you now this time of worship and ask, O God, that we may experience anew and afresh your presence again upon us. We pray for your blessing upon her whom you will use to speak to us this night, even as she leads us as a family in you. So be present with us, O God. Lead, guide, and direct us. For this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us when we gather as a family to be able to pray together as we sing.
The Lord be with you. Praise the Lord. And so I invite you to join in the reading of the psalm for today, which will be read responsively. The words printed in bold are the responses. The Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be God, my Savior. God is the God who avenges me, who saves me from my enemies. Therefore, I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing the praises of your name. Turn from evil and to do good. Then you will dwell in the land forever. Learn to do right, seek justice. Defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the widow. Give thanks to the Lord, glory in his name. And so we join our voices together as we sing the hymn to God be the glory, great things he has done, so loved he the world that he gave us the Son. For immediately after the singing of that hymn, we will invite the acting bishop of the Heifelt and Eswatini Synod to read the Old Testament reading for us.
shall find our scripture reading from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 47. We read from verse 1 to verse 10. Our first scripture reading is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 47. We read from verse 1 to verse 10. Why sang we selem nyango wenju? Bega amanzi apu ma panzi gombundu wenju la sembu malanga. Gogbabu so benju babunga sembu malanga. Amanzi esa evela panzi. O sango tini logu nene luenju. Gaseni ngizimi kwe alta. Why sang pumisa ngenzela yesango? Gasenyagato, Wangi Zungesisa, Genzela, Enga Panze, a sanguini, Elinga Panze, Isango El Pegen Zeleni, Yasempo Malanga. Pega Guam Pompos, a man's or sangotini, Logunen, Lapo Umundu, a sepuma, a young Asempo Malanga, Eno Mutu, Wogulinganisa Sandensake, Walinganisa, Izingalo, Ezingulungwan. Wangi tabulisa emanzini, amanzi afinyelela emakagalini. Wabuye walinganisa inkulungwane, wangi tabulisa emanzini, amanzi afinyelele matulweni. Walinganisa futi inkulungwane, wangi tabulisa, amanzi afinyelelo kalweni. Waise buye walinganisa inkulungwane, kwa kungu mfula enge na kutabula. Ngoguba manzi aekuli. Amanzi ogusamba angumfula onge na kutajulwa. Wati kimi ndotana yomundu usubo nile na. Waisengi hambisa wangibuisela osebe nilomfula. Sengbu ile peka kwa kukoni mite miningi kakulo osebe nilomfula. Nga lapa na nga lapa. Waise tikimi la wamanzi apumele sfundeni sasempu malanga. Esela e araba. Aye elwanz. Aye elwanze lana apunyi suweyo. Kupili swe amanzi alo. Ya gutikonge okupila yokse. Okuswebe zela yokupile. Ezi ndaweni zonge. Lapo ifiga kona leo mifula emibili. Kube izi ntanzi ezi ningi kakulu. Ngoguba ese fige kona lawa manzi. Awo luanze haya kupilisu. Kupile konke, lapo mfula ufiga kona. Ya kutukume kuo abadobi kusuge la eeniketi, kuze kubese eneke laini. Kube ngo kwe negelua kwa, ma, kwa maneta. Ya kubakona izintanzi nge zintobo zazo, njenge zintanzi zo luanze olukulu. Zibe ziningi kakulu. This is the word of God.
Thank you. Please be seated. Good evening, everyone. Our gospel reading comes from the gospel according to John chapter 20, from verse 19 through to verse 21. Jesus appears to his disciples. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. Be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. This is the word of the Lord. We once again join our voices as we sing together hymn number 90 in our Kosa hymnals, Uyesu Li Temba Lami, whereafter we will invite the presiding bishop to give her address to the Connectional Executive and to the people called Methodist.
President, the past presiding bishop, Bishop Siwa, the General Secretary, Reverend Hensrod, bishops and the lay leaders of synods, unit leaders, members of the Connectional Executive who are joining us on Zoom, and those present here. Methodist people, wherever you are, the congregation at large, I greet you all in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. First, I must thank the choir, Reverend Mabuza, the organist, for giving us this feel of worship, which we, some of us have missed for some months. And it feels now like we are still alive. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, to the minister here, Reverend Mlombi, for opening this church for us. Thank you so much. I welcome everybody to this service, which marks the official opening of the 2020 CE meeting. This year, as it has been said, has been filled with unprecedented events. We had a plan to hold the Connectional Executive and Conference in Kimberley, Mukala Muntle Synod. That plan was disrupted, conference had to be suspended, and so we meet in these next two days as Connectional executive that is mandated to deal with some essential business of conference. Today it is day 189 of lockdown in South Africa. It is proper as we start to acknowledge that COVID-19 has touched all of us in different ways. Some of us have been infected by the virus and they know exactly what it does to the body. But in spite of that, they recovered. Some others have lost their loved ones to the virus. They've gone through the trauma of COVID-19 funerals, where you don't see your loved one for the last time. As a church, we have lost members and clergy to it. But as worshipers of God, God of all comfort, in the words of St. Paul, we comfort each other with the comfort that we ourselves receive from God. And so even now and today as we meet physically and virtually, we meet as Wesleyans. So we can say in Charles Wesley's words, and are we yet alive? And see each other's face. Glory and praise to Jesus for his redeeming grace. And Charles continues, what troubles have we seen? What conflicts have we passed? Fightings without and fears within since we assembled last. Year 2020 started well for the connection, the MCSA. We started with excitement of the inauguration of three new synods. The Synod of Namibia, of Moloko, and Kamdibu. We had plans 
to celebrate 50 year anniversaries of some of our synods. We had plans to celebrate 200 years of the arrival of Reverend William Shaw in the Eastern Cape. While we were looking forward to these events, then came COVID and disrupted all our plans. It has thrown the, world, the whole world into a time of crisis and turmoil. Recently, we've been told over a million deaths have happened in the world through this virus. The people of the world, the continent, and our connection are facing the challenges of the destruction caused by this pandemic. The church, like all sectors of society, has been hugely disrupted. Since March, as a connection, we have lived under various regulations that limit gatherings, which disrupted our worship life and ministry as we know it. While these regulations are being relaxed, particularly in South Africa, the virus remains among us and as dangerous as always. According to the scientists, it will take something like two to three years to find the vaccine. It therefore remains everybody's responsibility to prevent the spread of the virus and to ensure that lives are saved. As churches reopen, I must emphasize that strict adherence to lockdown regulations must be adhered to. Thank you, Nwanda. <clears throat> At this point, I want to thank all the Methodist clergy and all in the leadership of societies, circuits, and organizations at all levels. In spite of the restrictions on coming together to worship, ministers and preachers and leaders of organizations have creatively found ways to minister and send messages of the gospel to our members through Zoom, Facebook, WhatsApp, email, etc. Daily devotions, sermons, services, announcements, etc. continued within the connection. These innovative ways of ministering to our people have kept us together in spirit as people called Methodists. We are also grateful to ecumenical bodies for keeping us together, guiding and supporting the churches in different countries of our connection. At a connectional level, must thank our communications director, Bongi, who has relayed information and kept us in touch with what has been happening. While we are doing our best, we need to acknowledge that like the whole world, COVID-19 has put us as a church in a state of shift and a state of transformation. Now the theme that I put before the Methodist people this conference going forward is guided by God's mission, reimagining healing and transformation. When I was given an opportunity to address conference last year, I declared that the MCSA does not need a new vision statement. I affirmed the last year's theme that called us to sharpen our effectiveness as a church as we walk humbly with God. I was and I'm even now convinced that the vision of a Christ-healed Africa remains relevant. COVID-19 has been a light bearer, 
shining a sharpening light into the multiple pandemics that are destroying the world, and in particular, the continent of Africa. <clears throat> to highlight a few, COVID-19 has resurrected and shone the light on the pandemic of global racism. It has shined the light on a worldwide cry from women as they are abused and killed. It has shown the light on the degradation and abuse of the earth and depletion of natural resources, the violence imposed on children and young people, through inequality of education systems and the inhumane ways in which their bodies are physically and sexually abused. We see wars and conflicts that displace people and turn them into unwanted refugees. The dehumanization of the queer human beings, the unequal access to health care facilities and medicine, unequal access to basic needs like shelter, water, food, etc. We see the growing trend of self-serving leaders of governments, leaders of private sector and politicians, the rising levels of poverty, hunger and un unemployment, the socio-economic divide is ever widening as the poor are getting poorer. Suffering and pain abounds in the world and in Africa. So while we long have been proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ for healing and transformation, the vision of a Christ-healed Africa is far from being realized. However, as a church and individual Christians, we cannot lose hope or be discouraged by what we see. While it is natural to be disoriented and stay behind locked doors, like the first disciples after the crucifixion of Christ, we cannot forget who we are. As the Father has sent me, said Jesus, I am sending you. And so as Christ's church, we are the sent ones, sent to partner with God in God's mission, the mission to redeem and transform all creation. As a church, some time ago we took a resolution as one of our transforming goals, and the resolution was we make a resolve to be guided by God's mission. Even at this time, when sands are shifting and the world is covered with fear, mental and physical sickness, death and hopelessness, we dare not let anything guide us but God's mission. There is no doubt that God is at work healing and transforming the world, even in the midst of the suffering that we see and experience. While guided by God's mission, I hear God calling us to reimagine. I hear this call as I read the familiar story of Ezekiel's vision of fresh and life-giving water that flows from the temple. Now Ezekiel was a priest prophet who had served in the temple as a priest, concerned with the inside of the temple, concerned with the rituals and ceremonies of the temple, until he was exiled when Nebuchadnezzar captured Jerusalem and exiled Jews to Babylon. <clears throat> it was when in exile that God called him to be a prophet and speak on behalf of God. Through God's messages and visions that Ezekiel received, 
He encouraged his fellow exiles who were discouraged and depressed by having to live in a strange land. We know the words of their lament. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange world? Ezekiel called, was called for a time like that to speak on behalf of God. In this vision, Ezekiel is brought to the entrance of the temple outside the temple, as though God is saying to Ezekiel, you will not see what I'm doing if you remain within the temple. Get outside and then you will see what I am doing. Now, as he stands outside the temple, he is shown life-giving water flowing from under the, te the temple. As it flows, it becomes deeper and deeper until it becomes a river that no one could cross. He is then led to the bank of this river to see the great number of trees on both sides of the river with fruit to eat and leaves to heal. He sees the river flowing down the desert of Araba until it gets to the Sea of Araba, which is called the Dead Sea. And when it gets to the Dead Sea, it dilutes the salty water that kills, and it turns it into fresh water, where fish multiply and provide food for fishermen, and provide livelihood for fishermen. What an image of hope for the exiles. The water that poured out from under God's house represented the unrestricted flow of God's blessing to the people of God. The message to the exiles was, don't give up on God. Out of God's throne flows all that gives life. And when God intervenes, there will be abundance. Now all of us, friends, at one time or another, we come to a desert place, a dry space of the soul, where nothing seems to be going right, where God seems to be silent. Our faith at those times start to shrivel up and to shrink. And we begin to be self-serving. We begin to care more about self, and we forget the mission of God. It has been pointed out that with COVID-19, there is a rise of mental illness and fatigue, because all of us are concerned. What about me? What about my children? What about my parents? It's all about us, as though our livelihood and our lives are in our hands. Our lives and our livelihoods are in God's hands. We as followers of Christ, of course, are not immune to these fears and these doubts that come with difficult times. It is at these times, friends, when we need to go deeper and deeper in our relationship with Christ. It is relationship with God 
that hands over everything to God, that can lead us to this space where Ezekiel was, the space of being able to see what is not happening but what is going to come. The space where we are able to, to, to stand up and say, we will do what we can in order for the kingdom of God to be fulfilled because we know that our God is at work and he calls us to be partners with him in the work that he's doing in the world. It is from that deep faith that we become agents of hope who continue to bring hope, reimagining and envisioning the reign of God in the world. It is the faith that is able to look beyond what is in front of us and see what will come when God intervenes. Now, what is this reimagination that we are talking about? <clears throat> In a book, Chasing Social Justice, Laurie Shermans defines reimagination as, I quote, a theological concept that stems from the belief that the world is fallen and that the mission of God through Christ is to reconcile humanity and the whole cre creation to God's self. This work of God, of reconciling all creation, flows through the followers of Christ, the church, and into the world. Reimagining for the church means allowing the picture of the reconciled world to propel their actions, end quote. As in the vision of Ezekiel, God's life-giving water coming from the temple comes through the actions and words that become embodied in our life together as a church and in interaction with the world around us. Reimagining is the ability to see beyond the here and now through active listening to the Holy Spirit and to be open to the changing times and to what God is saying to the changing world. The definition of the, way, of the word as expounded by Miriam Webster Dictionary is to reimagine is to imagine again or to imagine anew. It is to form a new conception, to rethink or to redefine. Reimagining implies change, evaluating and shifting parameters of concept and perceptions, and even completely renaming outcomes. To reimagine healing and transformation, therefore, calls upon us to look again at what it means for us to proclaim the gospel for healing and transformation. It calls us to have this picture of healing as we work at what is not healed yet. It means we join the reimagining tradition of the prophets and become part of God's grace in the world. We join the movement of God's long arc of justice, not the God of personal piety, divorced from the pain of the world. Instead, we join God who listens to the cries of the oppressed and acts to release them, reimagining standing in the tradition of Methodism calls us to our vocation or sacred work, which is conscious action grounded in the experience of God's grace that has us as priesthood of all believers, pointing and participating in Christ's redeeming action of grace in the world. <clears throat> Reimagining, therefore, friends, calls us to be humble enough to admit that now and then, 
our processes, our structures, our methods, our traditions, our practices as a church need rethinking and review. As it is for any church, it is easy for any church to slip into the entrapments and addictions of the past. At this time of transition, fellow Methodists, this God-given gap that we have, this time when what was doesn't work anymore, and yet we don't know what will be. Now this gap that God is giving us through COVID-19 calls us to engage in reimagining for our church as a Methodist church. And the good thing about this gap of the was and the will be is that we are all equal in this space. There's no one who knows more than anyone because we all have not been here. And so we start from the same space, all of us, to say, who are we? And if we are the church of Christ, the church concerned about healing and counseling, healing and transformation, what is it that should be our essentials? As a church that calls itself a missional church, what is it in our practices that is a waste of God's time? That doesn't help anybody, doesn't heal anybody, doesn't transform anybody or anything but we continue to do it year after year. And we spend lots of money on it because this is the Methodist church we know. I think we are put by God in a nice space to recreate, to reform, to renew, to focus our mission work on things that heal and things that transform, on things that reconcile, and things that save the world, on things that improve our communities, and things that change the injustices of this world. That's the reimagination I'm talking about. I'm not talking about moving chairs. I'm talking about a deep, deep, deep looking at ourselves as individuals, as Christians, and as, as the Church of Christ, and say, what are we about? And given this space, God is calling us to reimagine. I want to call all organizations of this church. I want to call all circuits and societies, led by ministers and the leaders of organizations to this space of reimagination. What is our focus? And what does our focus change in the world in which we live? <clears throat> now, friends, I believe that reimagining for us as Methodist is to be grounded on our theology. We cannot be a church that does things because others are doing it. I want to commend the work that UCOM has started to do of discussing and talking about who we are, our doctrines and our practices so that as we begin to do things, we're starting from the knowledge part. These conversations and theological conversations, doctrinal conversations, are meant to keep us relevant and confident 
to practice our faith. Allow me to quote an Afri one of the African theologians. She says, the work of reimagining is the work of decolonizing our theology and rereading scripture. It is about redeeming the relationship we have with creation. It critiques and reshapes how we build our economy away from the practice that is profit-centered to one that safeguards life, human life and the life of the earth. This reimagining work is the cry of Steve Bantubiko to the oppressed people of South Africa. It is taking back our Im imagination, the reclaiming of our minds, the telling of our stories, because the greatest weapon in the hand of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed." End quote. From our theology, we must be able to rethink our practices, to delineate what is essential from what is not. Our practices must get closer to the realities of the poor. If indeed we are, the, we are to incarnate God who sides with the poor, the task of theologians and clergy is to lead and guide these conversations in the circuits and within organization. As a church that exists for the society, we should be able to strengthen our involvement with communities and our prophetic voice and practice shall be heard at all levels. Now friends, all our groupings in the MCSA need to start asking the question, which of our practices is life-giving and which one should be discarded? An example, in the midst of the deadly virus, we need to think how to reshape our gatherings and our events. How should we organize our funerals, Easter services, our conventions, our robing services, the list goes on. Having been an events-driven church, because if you look at our year plans, it's events from January to December. And we gather people. Maybe this is the time of moving from being a gathering church to being a scattering church. Because you know COVID has said the church is non-essential in its gathering. You hear that? They didn't say the church must not do its work. They said in its gathering, the church is not essential. And so we are essential, not as we gather in big tents and perform and do our, uh, the things that we like. There's nothing wrong with them, but they are not essential. And they don't change the lives of people. They don't heal or transform our communities. But at our, all our level, let's talk about these things. Because this is the gap that we have been given. With the economic effects of COVID-19, many people losing jobs, poverty rising. There's a need to reimagine ways of maintaining our ministries and our mission over and above member giving. The practice of excluding and embarrassing the poor members, threatening them by not bearing them if they don't give, that practice is not of God and it is to be discarded. 
while those with the ability to give are to be encouraged to do so, for mission and ministry to continue, it should not be expensive to belong to the MCSA to the point that the poor have to leave because the Methodist Church is for the rich. Reimagine. Over these past six months, many circuits have struggled to meet assessments as a result of our lockdowns and not meeting. Some circuits have closed stations due to the unaffordability of ministry. The need to reimagine another financial model has long been raised in this connection. There is a committee that is dealing with this, and I'm hoping that it will accelerate its work. But as a church, we are being called to, to reimagine the, the models of ministry that are mission-focused and relevant to our context. This situation, however, friends, does not need to occupy us in such a way that it consumes us. It cannot be that in all our gatherings we talk assessments. Understanding that we are a missional church that must show and show up in the communities at a time of need. The connection set aside some money, released funds, and said to sacred synods and societies, See what you can do to help the communities where you are and apply, we will give you the results. The applications are trickling, slowly, and we are consumed by maintenance matters rather than mission matters. May I encourage, it's not easy, but it is possible with God that we believe in. May we shift our thinking so that our focus is on the mission of God. It is on the healing that needs to take, to take place. On issues of justice, I just want to make a call that our commitment to healing and transformation demands that the issues of justice are taken seriously. Reimagining a better world for all calls us to be a listening church, listening to the voices of the marginalized, listening to understand and not to reply, which is one of the, the shortcomings of the church. We listen in order to, to answer back. Let us listen in order to understand so that we can come alongside with the marginalized and actually um, amplify their voices as they cry for justice. In the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the moral arc of the universe is long and it bends towards justice. Reimagining demands that we in all our structures or organizations evaluate our participation in the marginalization of some people through our traditions, policies, usages, and so on. And that we become champions of justice. To repeat what I said during the seven weeks campaign, that we had on gender-based violence. A church that is able to reimagine a different world free of injustices, particularly gender-based violence, is a church that, that openly condemns injustice, 
in the strongest terms and declare it for what it is. We dare not be silent in the face of injustice, whatever culture or tradition dictates. I call on, on all Methodists throughout the connection at all levels to declare in word and deed that gender-based violence is a sin, a sin that violates both the perpetrator and the victim, and it cannot be tolerated. Let our churches become life-giving spaces that model alternative communities where women and men, girls and boys, have their dignity respected. Children and youth. Prioritizing youth and children is critical for the life and the future of our church, especially now. We should encourage them to take our positions of responsibility and leadership in the church. The church should also be serious about giving them space to be who they are and allow them to be innovative and breathe new life into the church. If we do not do this, I'm afraid, the work of reimagining will not even begin because our age mates are so used to what has been. But the young ones are able to look in the future. I agree with Alvin Toffler who says these words. The secret message communicated to most young people today by the society around them is that they are not needed. That the society will run itself quite nicely until they, at some distant point in the future, will take over the reins. Yet the fact is that the society is not running itself nicely because the rest of us need all the energy, brains, imagination, and talent that only young people can bring to bear down on our difficulties. For society, to attempt to solve its desperate problems without the full participation of even very young people is imbecile, end quote. Young people and children have a lot to offer, and therefore they need to be part of this reimagination. The disruption of education during lockdown <clears throat> has caused anxiety amongst learners and their parents. We go into every year with goals, set and expectations. Education has already been a challenge in a society that has so many inequalities along racial, gender, and economic lines. While some were able to continue their studies through online learning, many, in fact millions, were left behind as a church, we need to reimagine what our role should be at this time in the area of education, particularly education for the children of the poor. The, one, the last point I want to raise is the issue of the pandemic of corruption. The level of unemployment in the countries of our connection is out of proportion and COVID-19 has compounded it. The main victims of this state of affairs are young people, young men and young women. And the corruption we see in government circles, private sec sector, and even in the church is adding to the problem. We call on all leaders of the, the governments of the connection to reject and fight corruption in their countries. The connection, as you know, is made of six countries. South Africa, Swaziland, Lesotho, Botswana, um, and Mozambique. And the call is directed to all these countries. 
But for me, the call is to be directed to all those in leadership in the continent of Africa. We hear the cries of the people of Zimbabwe every day as the government there does its own things. We hear the cries of the people of the DR Congo as the government there does its own things. Go north to Mali everywhere. There are conflicts. Those in leadership are leading for themselves rather than for the people they lead. We are seeing in a number of our countries the recruitment of young people to become part of the groups, the, the fighting groups, the insurgents, and so on. It is happening in, in Mozambique. With all of these things happening, we call on the governments of these countries to be people of conscience and to lead as though they lead God's people and to be aware that they are in the positions of leadership for the sake of God's people. But more than that, we call upon all people with conscience, people of faith, to hate corruption. All people who hate suffering should hate corruption because corruption adds to the suffering. I call upon us as Methodist people to reject corruption, however much it offers to us and our families. When, uh, when some of us are alleged to be involved in corrupt activities, we don't only get embarrassed, but the message of the gospel is hindered. Message of the gospel is blocked because the people then would say, what is it that they are, they are preaching? How do they condemn corruption when they are corrupt themselves? Methodist people, I beg, let us, let us desist from anything that is corrupt. And so as I end, friends, may we always experience the presence of Christ in and, am and amongst us. May our resolve to be guided by God's mission be propelled by our faith, deep faith in God who, who gives abundantly. May we use the time we have been given reimagining relevant, just and graceful ways of participating in God's mission. We cannot do it on our strength, of course. Our strength comes from remembering who we are and whose we are. We are the children of God, whose love for all creation spans all ages, all times, all situations to eternity. And it is this God who calls us to reimagine a better world where we will partner with God and bring about healing and transformation. In Jesus' name, amen.
Bishop, you said our peers talk about a choir, but now we know you can have a virtual choir as well, as that rendition has come to us. So we invite now our lay president, Mr. James Corsi, to lead us in the prayers of petition and intercession. Presiding Bishop and the entire congregation, may I invite us all, before I lead this prayer, to be silent for a while and reimagine of what God did show us during the lockdown when all the churches were closed and we are unable to worship together in the churches and he showed us outside the churches Amen. Gracious God, our Father, in your word you said, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and you will be opened. We, your creation, are here living in the era where our lives are threatened and exposed to gender-based violence, to COVID-19 disease, to racism mentality, to human trafficking syndicates, to killings by demon-possessed syndicates, syndicates of corruption. We submit our request asking you, Lord, to intervene by stopping all these social ills which terrorize our lives. We are knocking at your door, Father God, crying out in desperation because of the level of stress we have as your people during this time where we see a lot of things happening which are unbecoming in our lives, and in your church, and in your nations. Seeking your help that you save us as your creation from the evil forces of the principalities that are in the heavenly realms. Lord, open your door for us so that we can get in and hide in you as our sanctuary, as our rock of ages in which we can find solace. Lord, in your mercy. Father God of order, God of healing voice, God of leadership, God of healing, God of transformation, and God of good health, I now pray for the church your church, that is pres its presence and prophetic voice, be heard and felt among communities, among societies, and also among nations. I pray for nations and their leaders that they invite you in their lives so that they can be able to provide 
ethical leadership in the nations that they are leading. I pray for men that they provide compassionate care to women and children and stop abusing and killing them. I pray God for you to transform all abusive men and make them offer their hearts to you, Almighty God, and submit so that at least they can see the wrong things that they might be doing in your world. I pray for victims of gender-based violence that you heal them socially, you heal them emotionally, you heal them spiritually and physically. I pray for the families of the deceased individuals that you comfort those who are left behind, who have lost their significant others. Give them strength and heal them. Lord of healing and transformation, I pray that you heal and transform our lives. Lord, in your mercy. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you. Well, friends, we have come almost to the end of this very significant service marking the official beginning of the gathering of the members of the Connectional Executive for 2020. Just for the members of the Connectional Executive who are on Zoom, is you are just to remind you that the invitation link for our sessions for tomorrow will be sent to you at the end of the service. So please do make sure that you check your emails as you will be receiving that link. This evening we will also be forwarding to you the address of the presiding bishop that would give you an opportunity to be able to reflect upon the written word in front of you as we would probably engage on the important issues the presiding bishop has, has, has mentioned. You will also receive in your emails this evening the daily record. We ask that you please go through that record of the uh, constituting of the CE this afternoon so that we may attest and sign that off as part of our record keeping of our meeting and a reminder that registration will start at 8 o'clock tomorrow with a request that you be seated by 8.20 to start at 8.30. The presiding bishop has already acknowledged and thanked uh, our gracious hosts for the use of this wonderful facility uh, all day today here at Bedford View, to the members of the Real Choir and the members of the Virtual Choir for being present with us, to our very accomplished organist who has led us um, this evening, and to the members of the MCO staff who have ensured that all protocols have been observed and have worked tirelessly in order to make this event happen for us. To you, we want to say thank you very much. Whilst it is a virtual CE, there is also a physical presence and there's people who travel to be with us physically this evening all the way from the Central Synod, Bishop Rivas and his lay leader, Mr. Mbulwana, the Acting Bishop of the Heswa Synod, Highfield and Eswatini, Reverend Guanyana, and Dr. Gwabe, the lay leader. 
Limpopo all the way from the other side. Bishop Mkhotu, who is with us physically here, we are so grateful that you could be with us. But you see, even the borders couldn't keep us apart from each other. All the way from Malopo is Bishop Molale, who has also joined us here this evening. And we have been so grateful to the others, members of the Connectional Executive, staff of MCO, who have joined us to create a physical presence as we use a hybrid of methods. Thank you so much for being present, and we pray that God will bless you. A reminder to all those who have joined us virtually on the various platforms, you can join us again tomorrow evening on the 2nd of October at 5.30 again for our Connectional Memorial Service, which will be conducted from the same sanctuary as we will be paying tribute to all ministers who have passed on since the last conference and remembering significantly all our members who too have passed on into eternity. Similarly, you are also invited to share on the Facebook and other social media platforms on Saturday morning at 8.30 for the connectional service of reception into full connection for our ordinance. Um, they will be joining the CE and will be received there publicly uh, on Saturday morning, 8.30, and this will be broadcast live. And then you are welcome again to join the Connectional Executive in its closing ceremonies at 6 o'clock on Saturday evening, which will also be a live broadcast, this time from our offices in Bruma. We now bring this time of worship to a close. As we sing together the hymn, Who Will Save Our Land and People? Who Can Rescue Us From Wrong? And thereafter, the presiding bishop will be giving the blessing.
We don't hold hands anymore. Just let us bless each other this way. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you.